Dear Mr. Chairman, dear friends, dear colleagues, it is my honor and pleasure to join you in the 9th All-Russian Arithmology Congress and I would like to invite you joining me in my first presentation regarding epicardial ablation and its challenges in interventional electrophysiology. Regarding this presentation, I have no conflict of interests to declare. So, let's look at an overview. I will first discuss some simple but important points regarding getting epicardial access, and after that, I would like to share with you some challenges that we may encounter during epicardial ablation, including ad adhesions, bypass grafts, and some other issues. So, the most important thing regarding epicardial axis is the needle, and, uh, and I would like to recommend using the TUI needle because this needle, compared to the other needles that we using for epicardial axis, is less traumatic and the possibility for RV puncture and injury to the adjacent organs is clearly less than the other needles. The second important point for the epicardial axis is we have to use a Y connector to give the contrast and also to pass the guide wire. And the important thing is if we want, if we want not to use a Y connector, we can directly connect the and syringe to our needle. But the most important thing, this syringe should be without a screw because screwing in and out the syringe may move the needle and we may lose our access to the epicardial space. So the first step for epicardial access to have, as you can see here, is to have a normal fluoroscopy image. And usually this is a very good guide because we can see with a white line, as we see here, the epicardial space. So in a way, this is a kind of um, guidance for us to know exactly where the epicardial space is during epicardial puncture. After that, we may have different kind of uh, axis, anterior and inferior axis. And as you can hear, I used inferior axis in this case and a small amount of contrast to see the structures on our way to the epicardial space. And after seeing that we are in the epicardial space, we put the guide wire inside the epicardial space and then we have our axis. So now we go to the challenges that we may encounter during epicardial ablation, and one of them are the adhesions. So before going epicardial uh, ablation and epicardial access in patients suspected to having adhesions, we always have to ask, is the procedure is really indicated? Do we have another alternatives? Do this patient has already epicardial substrate or the epicardial ablation may improve outcome in this patient. We have to ask if there are some alternatives, for example, antiarrhythmic therapy, needle ablation, high power ablation, and in the near future, pulse field ablation. And if we have no alternative, then also, then we can go for epicardial ablation. And we always have to think about patient characteristics that are, com that are combined with increased risk of complication, like, for example, prior cardiac surgery, body habitus like significant obesity and anticoagulation, and intra-abdominal anatomy like hepatomegaly or subdiaphragmatic bowel at the site of puncture, which increases the risk of complication in these patients. So, this is an interesting study which showed among 155 patients who received epicardial ablation, 13, it means 8% of the patients had admission. So always one in every 10 patients that we want to do epicardial ablation has adhesions. And one of the major risk factors, beside from prior cardiac surgery and myocarditis, perimyocarditis, is renal insufficiency. In patients with renal insufficiency and renal failure, we have more adhesions and we encounter adhesions more frequently. 
and the most important thing is that in patients with and without adhesions we may have some differences in success rate because in case of adhesions we have limited access but at the end of the day the complication rate is similar in patients with and without adhesions in epicardial space this is an interesting study on 10 consecutive patients with prior non-coronary cardiac surgery and in eight patients and pericarditis in two other patients and in this study they showed that using ablation catheter a steerable sheet pigtail or guide wire and taking time we can lose these adhesions and provide enough space to doing epicardial ablation so at this point i would like to share one of my patients with you as you can see in this video we get the epicardial axis we have a guide wire in epicardial space but you see that with the contrast we see that there are some adhesions and the contrast cannot flow freely in the epicardial axis but as you saw in this study we can use a steerable sheet catheter pigtail or guide wire to lose these adhesions and this is our patient and you can see here that i use the steerable sheet and catheter and with we have to take time and move the catheter slowly and finally we can lose the adhesions and lyse these adhesions and provide enough space and access for epicardial ablation in most of these patients this is also another interesting study in 162 patients who underwent epicardial access 18 had prior cardiac surgery and this is very important that the access was successful in 12 of 18 of the patients using inferior approach and sub um, puncture and uh, this is very important because uh, usually we think if the patient has prior cardiac surgery we cannot access the epicardial uh, space but this study showed that in a significant number of the patients despite previous cardiac surgery we can access the epicardial space using interventional and method and epic uh, sub xiphoid puncture as we already discussed and see together so the second step is uh, sometimes uh, a conventional axis is not possible and then we have to go to the surgical axis. We have two different kinds of surgical axis. Either we use the sub xiphoid window as you can see here and uh, we can also use a lateral thoracotomy and it's very important we have to decide based on the VT morphology. Is, is, is this a VT more on the inferior side and inferior wall we can access from sub xiphoid puncture? Is this, a VT, uh, is this a VT from high lateral and anterior wall? Then in these cases, we can use an anterior thoracotomy and epical uh, lateral thoracotomy to have the best access to the VT region. And the most important thing is before going for surgical access, we have a kind of imaging, usually CT. We analyze the pictures with the surgeons to decide which access is the best for the patient and best for the access to the site of VT of origin, the origin of the VT. So, uh, the most important point is uh, either we get the access interventionally or surgically but this study showed that in 60 patients who underwent epicardial ablation epicardial access interventionally and surgically had the same outcome and therefore the access the way that we access the epicardial space does not influence the outcome of the catheter ablation the most important thing now we are talking about adhesions and we know after epicardial ablation sometime after the first ablation we may need to access the epicardial space for the second ablation and therefore this is very important to always after one epicardial access and ablation give some corticosteroids to prevent inflammation and adhesions for the future 
catheter ablation. As you can see in this picture, on the on the above row, we see the, some uh, cardiac, uh, some epicardial space in pigs after epicardial ablation without using corticosteroids, showing adhesions and inflammation. And and the below we see epicardial space in pigs having epicardial ablation and you can see that after giving triamcinolone we have no adhesions to the epicardial space so this is very important after every epicardial ablation giving some kind of corticosteroids to prevent adhesions for the future procedures so what about the bypass grafts we can see here a patient with inferior wall myocardial infarction negative concordance in epicardial lead and previous endocardial ablation was unsuccessful. So as we said, sometimes we think epicardial um, uh, cardiac surgery may make it impossible uh, to access the epicardial space, but this is an example, a patient after bypass surgery, you see that we were easily able to access the epicardial space. And it's very interesting to see that even we are able to see the grafts inside the epicardial space especially in these patients it's very important to know the anatomy the number of grafts and the location of the grafts and the location of the clinical vt so we can decide if we are able to go into the epicardial space the second important point in this patient is that in patients with coronary artery disease especially those who are not completely revascularized there are some venous bridge between a parietal and visceral epicardium and these bridges can be damaged during catheter movement and these damage to this small vein bypass between parietal and visceral epicardium may cause uh, bloody pericardial effusion and also tamponade we, we have to be careful about these uh, cases and this is the epicardial map of the patient activation and substrate mapping showing the successful ablation site after getting access uh, up to the epicardial space in this patient we have to, we talked about interventional access how to solve the problem having the inter, uh, that we encounter during epicardial access surgical access but sometimes the adhesions are so massive and also there are many number of bypass uh, grafts inside the epicardial space that makes it impossible to go interventionally or with uh, epicardial window to the epicardial space and in very rare cases as you can see here we may need open thoracotomy and catheter ablation under direct vision and with a simple mapping ablation, the mapping and ablation technique, we were able to ablate the VT in this patient uh, with inferior wall myocardial infarction. So, what are the other challenges that we may encounter in epicardial space? The first one is the phrenic nerve. So, sometimes we have to ablate, and unfortunately, the phrenic nerve is looked very close to our ablation site. So in the near future, the solution is simple, going using the pulse field ablation. But right now, still using the RF ablation, usually we can use double uh, puncture technique. So we have two guide wires, and as you can see here, we have, uh, we have uh, two guide wires and two sheets, and we use one of the sheets for ablation catheter, the second one for uh, PTA balloon and as you can see here we can using this balloon to elevate the phrenic nerve and also preventing phrenic nerve injury during epicardial access so this the next question is, is what we the, ch the challenge in epicardial is use the general anesthesia or sedation so we prefer uh, conscious we we prefer deep sedation during our uh, epicardial ablation procedures. Some centers use the general anesthesia. The most important thing is the success rate and complication rate is similar between both techniques. So it depends on you which um, method you prefer. 
Personally, I prefer deep sedation without intubation and general anesthesia, but in some patients, of course, general anesthesia will be needed. So, the next question is, do the procedure during anticoagulation on anticoagulation or sh should we discontinue anticoagulation? In this study, there is a trend, that, as we can see, in 205 patients are undergoing percutaneous epicardial axis and ablation that doing the ablation on anticoagulation increases the risk of bleeding or transfusion, but there is no difference in the risk of a stroke. So that's the reason that we usually prefer to do the epicardial ablation with an INR below two. But in some patients, of course, it's very difficult. For example, if the patient has a mechanical valve, then we prefer to do uh, the epicardial ablation on anticoagulation using either the interventional axis or surgical window. So, the next point which is very important and uh, in many cases may lead to failed epicardial ablation is the effect of intrapericardial fluid using irrigation catheter on ablation, lesion size and efficacy. So you see on the left side, this is the lesion ablation lesions with epicardial fluid, intraepicardial and intrapericardial fluid. And on the right side, the fluid was drained. And you can see the lesions are much larger. So the most important thing is when we used an irrigated tip catheter in the epicardial space, we have always tried to keep the epicardial space dry and we remove the fluid during the ablation, either manually or using a suction device to remove the fluid from epicardial space. And in this case, we can prevent ablation failure in some patients. So the next point is that uh, is, uh, in the epicardial space, we have coronary arteries, uh, which uh, ablation near coronary arteries may increase the risk of complication. And we have epicardial fat, which if it's more than five millimeter in diameter, it may increase the risk of unsuccessful ablation. So it's very important and useful to use image integration. As you can see here on the left side, one of our patients, integration of fluoroscopy, coronary angiography, and 3D mapping catheter to prevent injury to the coronary arteries. At the same time, we can use 3D imaging of the epicardial fat tissue and integrate it, it to our mapping system so we can know exactly where are the fats, um, pads, and know why the ablation on some regions may, may not be successful and use, for example, more power and different kind of catheter for ablation and in these regions. So at the end, we can use uh, as an alternative or as a supplementary tool to epicardial ablation. In some patients, we can use different kinds of methods. For example, we can use bipolar ablation, we can use uh, high power ablation from endocardial space, and this is another example. We can use needle ablation. In the future, I think the pulse field ablation will soon replace all these alternative methods for ablation of deep substrate and epicardial VT. So this is a, a uh, this is a possible tool that may help us to ablate the deep substrate, the needle ablation. And this is one of uh, our patients which had an epicardial VT and because of left ventricular assist device, the access to the epicardial space was very difficult. So we decided to use um, uh, in this example, a thermocool SF catheter and use off-label high power ablation from endocardial space to ablate a VT which was on the epicardial side and was successful. So in such cases, we may need some creative and alternative ways to ablate the epicardial VT without going to the epicardial space and needle ablation and high power ablation should be, we have to be very careful. High power ablation and in the near future, pulse field ablation will help us to solve this problem. So at the end, I would like to summarize my presentation. We have to say 
that epicardial catheter ablation has steadily evolved into a practical and widely used approach for the treatment of ventricular tachycardia in a broad range of disease substrates, including patients with a history of prior cardiac surgery. Efforts were made in improving the safety of the access and prevention of the injury to adjacent structures, especially in patients with prior operation and or ablation. The last decade has yielded improvement in the cardiac imaging and energy delivery to the epicardial VT substrate using different kinds of catheters. And in the near future, you will see that still we have a tremendous need and potential for exploring alternative energy sources, hopefully in the near future, and also currently in the studies, pulse field ablation and delivery methods to further improve the results and success associated with epicardial ablation and decrease the possibility of complications. Once again, thank you for joining me and I hope that I will join you in the next Congress in person and not in an online basis. Thank you once again for your attention.